Kansas City, you've got a champion. Holy cow. Wow. We've got a lot to get to. It'll go as a sack. Frank the Shark Clark. Look at it as a Chiefs fan, you got to be thrilled with the fact that you kept that entire wide receiver core together. All right, Chiefs Kingdom, welcome to another episode of In the Trenches, and we have got a special one for you today. We've got exclusive interviews with Chiefs assistant head coach and special teams coordinator Dave Tobe, as well as offensive coordinator Eric Biami. And as you can tell, we are starting with Mr. Dave Tobe. And coach, I, I've got to continue the conversation that was just taking place of you back at the University of Missouri recruiting Nick Lecky back in Grapevine, Texas to go to Missouri. Please continue where you left off. Well, I mean, I didn't talk about how good of a player. I loved him on tape. I mean, he was a really good football player. And, you know, I was a former center myself. So I kind of I kind of knew what I was looking at. So I knew he was a good player. And and uh, I knew he would fit in at Missouri and try to recruit him. But just like I said before, he kind of blew me off. So hey. <laughs> <laughs> something new. This is amazing. Coach, one it of the is. things that – that we wanted to do in this episode, at least for the next 10 minutes or so while we've got you, we appreciate your time. It's just kind of going back and telling some of those stories that just naturally came out. But you've got to have an interesting perspective of your kind of career path and your journey. We talked about it when we wrote the long form a few years ago, but kind of how you got started into coaching. And the first thing I want to ask you about is just the parallels of kind of building a program. And because you saw it back at UTEP when you and Coach Reed first met under Bob Stoll, that in the 10 years before Coach Reed and you guys got together, I think UTEP had won like 17 games total. In the yeah. two years that you guys first got there and were together, you, that Coach came, that you guys went 17-7 and seven before you went to the University of Missouri. And then obviously with the Chiefs back right. in 2012 to 2013, it was the best single season turnaround in franchise history. So you've seen going from a program that struggled that need that leadership to where you're at now at both places. Just what parallels do you draw from back then? I know it was a while ago, but what you guys were able to do then and what you've seen over the last seven years in Kansas City. Well, I always say coaching's coaching, you know, and, and you gotta you gotta take guys from ground zero and, and teach them, you know, every little facet of the game. You gotta remember now I was a I was a strength coach for a lot of my college, you know, coaching career, most of my college coaching career until the last three years where I was moved over to defensive line. But uh, so I worked with the whole team all the time. So, it, you know, what I do now is very similar to what I was doing when I was a strength coach. Uh, worked with everybody, with every personality, and uh, which I really think helped me. It helped me now. It, it helped me then, you know, for, for what I do now. So, uh, you know, it's very, very, very similar as far as work with all the different personalities. Offensive guys are different than, de than, different, different than defensive guys and DBs are different than wideouts. And, uh, it teaches you to treat each guy differently, separately, and, you know, find what, what pushes their buttons and, uh, you know, and what gets them going. So I, I think, you know, all that, that stuff that I did when I was younger in college really helped develop me as, as the coach that I am today. Do you really feel like that, uh, having that widespread experience, you know, playing on the offensive line and then knowing all the different personalities in the weight room? Because um, sometimes guys have a different personality on the field versus in the weight room, right? So can oh, you no kind question. of – See, can you kind of like see through the BS and like know who's going to be good on your special teams and who you put it want this way? You you know what team. kind of character you find out exactly what kind of character guys are when you're when you're a strength coach, you know because they they let their guard down in the weight room, you know everybody puts their guard you know and you find out exactly what kind of guy guys they are and a lot of times scouts would come in and ask about players they they would come to me because I would shoot them straight I'd say hey you know uh, Nick Lecky he's an ass you know he's a <laughs> <laughs> you know, seems but, about right. <laughs> <laughs> you know so but yeah you're right I mean it's you know they let their guard down in there you kind of get to know what they are you know uh, you know when, when when no one's looking you know basically I think no one's looking uh, so you, you know you do, do see that side of them and sometimes it happens on special teams too you know they're not they're not being looked at as an offensive player defense you know I'm not going to decide whether they play on offense or defense and they kind of let their guard down a little bit but you know obviously when it comes to special teams they're going to show me everything they got so uh, you know, it's coaching's coaching. You know, I've said it before, you know, a lot of times, but, you know, it's just different type, different type caliber guys, you know, but it's all about motivation and getting them to play at their best ability. Hey, Coach, I know that uh, you like to get your hands on things and work with them, whether it's players and special teams in the weight room. Going back to when you were younger, building your own weight room equipment back when you were in high school and stuff. And then even in Columbia, building, Coach Reed told me you built your house that you lived in in Columbia from scratch. I did. So, I did. And, but I want to ask, because you mentioned it, the, the transition from 
strength coach to the field at the University of Missouri. We've talked about it before, and I know it's, it's a sensitive subject because it was a tragedy yeah. that, that allowed that to happen. But um, can you kind of just tell that story going to, to Corby Jones and Coach Jones uh, at, at Mizzou? Yeah, uh, Corby Jones was, was our quarterback, and uh, his dad was a D-line coach. Curtis Jones, and we were coming into the season. I can't remember what year it was now, but off the top of my head, but we were coming in. It was my last three years at Missouri, but anyway, we were coming in. This it was I think it was July. It was late. It was it was getting right before the season started, and he he had an aneurysm in his heart, it, you know, aorta, and it, you know, he basically you know died uh, just at home, I think, and it was brutal. I mean, it, and it was you know we were kind of up in arms what we were going to do, and. and Mo Ankney, the defensive coordinator at the time, I was always a guy. I was a, I was the strength coach, but I was always on the field helping as much as I could, probably illegally, but out there as much as I could, you know, helping offensive line and defensive line. Uh, he asked me if I would, you know, be willing to take it over, you know, for, for the season as an interim guy. So I did. And, you know, and of course, you know, we had a real good player over there named Justin Smith. So, uh, you know, I ended up, you know, you know we did pretty well. We, we had success and uh, you know, and, and Justin ended up being drafted, you know, after a couple of years and, uh, you know, his, his notoriety helped me, you know, get some, get noticed. And, uh, you know, and then once I moved over to coaching D line, I, I knew that's where I needed to be. I knew, I, I knew I needed to get out of the weight room uh, because I just loved it. I loved having my own room, a little small room of guys that, you know, I could really get my hands on and make a difference of what's going on on the football field a little bit more than I could as a strength coach. So, uh, that that really, um, you know, I knew that's what I wanted to do, and and that's you know, you know where it came about. And then, as an offensive lineman, then you have to sort of flip your mentality as when you're coaching D linemen, or you just kind of you're kind of coach them say, how did I used to get beat, or or how exactly. did I see, how did I beat people? Like, what yeah. what's your philosophy then? You know, being going the other side of the ball where you're just trying to create havoc instead of trying to control it. You know, being being an old lineman, I mean, it definitely gives you that perspective. You know, how you know how are you going to stop a guy? And, but then you flip it now. How are you going to get beat? I mean, what what happens? The guys get off off balance. They get all their weight on one leg. You counter. You know, I mean, you know what they're looking at. Little keys that that you look at as an offensive lineman. I would teach our guys not to give those keys away. You know, I mean, certain things. So uh, it does. It definitely it definitely helped me being an old lineman moving over to deep to coach defense. Uh, but deep down inside, I was an old lineman, but I always had that defensive mentality. You know, I, I was a uh, a little bit more of a nasty kind of tough. You know, I'm not saying old linemen aren't tough now. I was going to let coach know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I always had, I always had that edge. You know, like a defensive mentality, and I still do. You know, when I coach special teams, I still have that defensive get after them. You know, good cover teams. Uh, you know, nasty kind of. Uh, tough workman attitude coach I, we joke about it but we know that coach anybody time anyone who's talked to him about offensive line looks for those guys who are nasty the technique doesn't have to be perfect just get the work done and I've got to think that that's a reason that you guys hit it off and that you've been friends and you've known each other and worked together for so long and you and I we've joked trying to figure out what diner or restaurant it was down in yeah. El Paso that you guys met up with when coach Reed was at Northern Arizona when he came over to interview with you guys when you were already at UTEP but that obviously being a big moment for you guys, just the first time you met, but when the whole staff at Missouri got fired in 2000 and you had the opportunity to go to the University of Ohio as a strength coach, and yep. instead you decided to join Coach Reed in Philadelphia and become the first quality control special teams coach yep. in the country, just looking back, how difficult, because it seems easy that you're, it's NFL or college, but how difficult of a decision was that for you? And looking back, is that one of the biggest decisions that you've made? To well, I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you that story. It's a pretty good story. I mean, All right. uh, you know, I was, I was the last one on that staff to get a, to get a job that the whole staff, you know, re, re, you know, got new jobs and stuff all over the country, some in college, some in the NFL. And I was the last one to get a job. So uh, Ohio, you know, they called me and said, Hey, you know, we'll take you, you know, we, would you come up and interview for the strength? So I did, I interviewed and, and uh, Coach Grobe was the was the head coach back then, and, and uh, he offered me the job. So I come I come back home and I and I called Andy and I because he he's always asking me all the time what's going on, what do you got going, what do you got going, what do you got going. Mm -hmm. Never offered me a job. So I told him I said hey, I got this job offer at Ohio University as a, to be a strength coach. He goes don't take it. <laughs> I said he goes don't take it. I said okay. I said does that mean you got something? Well, just hang tight. Don't take it. 
and then uh, you know because he had to find he had to actually make a job you know he had to design a job a quality he called it a quality control off or a special teams slash D line quality control <laughs> job I mean I, I think I was the first assistant special teams coach in the in the whole league really you know but now everybody has two everybody has some guys some teams have three now. But I think I was the first one. I was John Harbaugh's assistant. You know, he was the, the head the special teams guy. Couldn't be behind a, a you know a guy that's more knowledgeable than him. And then Tommy Brazier was the D line coach. So I you know I was learning both. I didn't know which way I was going to go in the NFL. I didn't know if I was going to go D line or or special teams. But uh, you know the special teams thing just really just, just took off for me. I mean it was a uh, uh, something that I really had no idea. You know how expansive it was and, and, and how much impact it had on a, on a, on a game until I, until I got there uh, working with the Eagles. What have you learned over the years as far as building that special teams roster and having that sort of like those core special teams guys, like, you know, what philosophies and, and what things do you really look for, for, for when you're building that special teams lineup? That's a good, that's a good question. I, I like to, I like to have my own core group. I like to have a core group, you know, and I'm, I'm talking like a, anywhere from six to eight guys that are like four phase guys that play on everything. And then you have your select couple, three or four guys that are maybe one or two phase guys, you know, that, 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 that sprinkle in some guys, some of those guys that sprinkle in are starters, they're actual starters on offensive defense. But I like to have, uh, you know, that many guys, six to eight guys that are, that are four phase guys that, that that's all they do. You know, they play punt team, punt return, kickoff, kickoff return, you know, and then they, you know, obviously they play field goal, field goal block too, but, when I talk about four phases, those are the main four that I, that, that I, that I look at. So I like to get that down to where I have my group of guys that I, I trust and I know are going to give us 100% effort every time because at the end of the day, special teams all comes down to effort. Everybody has the same players, but it comes down to who's going to play harder on that down, on that particular down. And, and you've got to get – as a coach, you got to get your guys to play hard. That's the key. And then what do you think about New Orleans, like and the use of Taysom Hill? Has that, has that influenced um, how you ask people to get drafted or, or how you incorporate more sort of superstars into, the, into your special teams lineup? Has that changed yeah, I your think philosophy? It's, I, I, think it's, I think it's a great example of, uh, you know, the Peyton, Sean Payton understanding how important special teams is. You know, he's got a guy that, you know, he's going to depend on to be his backup quarterback at times, and he's got him in there playing four phases, covering kicks and, but he's good. I mean, he's darn good. I mean, he's, he's a real yeah, good he's player. A hustler. And, you know, he's a hustler. He's, he should be, you know, I thought last year should have been in a pro bowl, you know, uh, but you know, he's, he's just a solid, solid player that, uh, you know, we, we do the same thing here. I mean, we, we have guys that, you know, Shark uh, uh, Ward, you know, I mean, uh, Shark Davis Ward, sorry, mm -hmm. but you know, our corner, I mean, he's, he's a starting corner for us, but he's our best, corner on punt return he's, he's the best guy to go out there and I can count on him to single up a gunner where I can do other things inside I can put more guys in the box or double up or sometimes triple up the other gunner I can because I can leave him alone on the other side so he's one of those guys that loves being on special teams too as well coach I want to ask a similar question I don't know if in all the years that I've asked you a question I don't know if I've ever asked you this but you talk about those six to eight guys and you've had success everywhere you've gone the career that you had in Chicago before you came to Kansas City and then what you've been able to do here in Kansas City over the course of the entire six seven years how do you get guys those six to eight guys to buy in so much that allows you do you feel like the success is the buy-in from those guys the technique or the schemes that you guys coach, like what is it that not to give all your secrets away, but like, what is it that allows that's just, allowed you to have all that success? I think it's leadership. You know, we have, once, once you get it going and, and you have success the year before, you know, guy, guys like, you know, uh, Anthony Sherman. I mean, he's, mm -hmm. he's a guy that I can count on. It's going to get our room, right? Like if, if our room starts going the wrong way, we, we have guys late, you know, walking in the room late or something like that. It's only going to happen once, you know, I mean, he's going to, he's going to make, he's going to take care of it. Uh, so, you, you know, you have leadership like that, you know, Dustin, we're going to lose, we lost Dustin, but he was a great leader on that end of it. Uh, you know, but, and then uh, Dan Sorensen, I mean, you know, those guys are, they're just solid, solid guys that set the example and, and uh, gets everybody going in the right direction. And then uh, we don't accept anybody not to play with all out effort. It's just not acceptable in our room. Coach, last question before we let you go, we appreciate your time. It's just what, in, in regards to Dustin, um, I know it's, it's a loaded question, but what has he meant to you 
um, and your time here in Kansas City. Um, I, we know what he's meant to the community, but what has he meant to you personally as a coach and somebody that's it's been a leader in that room? Yeah, he's, you know, number one, he's a great friend. I mean, he's, you know, he's somebody that I can call and, and hopefully we stay friends, you know, forever. Uh, but really, I mean, as a punter, I mean, he's the best punter I ever coached, uh, you know, and, and hands down. Uh, he's, he's a great team leader, like I said, a great person, just a, you know, really a good teammate. I think everybody will tell you <laughs> they, they loved, you know, his practical jokes that he would do, and, you know, wearing the size 15 shoe on the team picture day and you know, in the front row, and just funny, just funny things that he would do. I mean, we're going to miss that, you know, and, and he was so good in the community, too. You know, with the team smile. I mean, that thing's a huge deal now across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and he's a great family man, awesome family man, spiritual guy. Uh, we're going to miss him. He's going to be hard to replace. Uh, but but that's life in the NFL. It's 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 brutal. You know, and it's it's a business. And uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate sometimes. But I you know I I still think he's got something in the tank. I think he's going to be, you know, get gets to the right plot spot. I mean, he's he'll, he'll be valuable to some some team this year. Absolutely. We know the dynamic is obviously going to change with your group, but uh, you know those guys, especially with the group that they just signed, both as the draft class and the UDFAs, that you got some more talent coming in that I know you're probably excited to work with, Coach. But we appreciate your time. Hopefully you stay safe and, and everything. Hopefully we catch up with you soon, man. You got it. All right, we just got done with great stuff there with Coach Tobe. And now we welcome on Chiefs Offensive Coordinator Eric Bieniemy. And just like we did story time with Dave Tobe talking about him <laughs> recruiting Nick back in high school, Coach Bieniemy, uh, you guys crossed paths uh, when you were a coach and Nick was a player with the Saints back in 09. Yes, the NFC Championship game. That was a hell of a game. Yeah, hell overtime. Yeah. Yes. That was when the, the Saints benefited from an overtime rule. <laughs> I, I will say this though that was one unbelievable experience and being a player I'm actually from New Orleans and I had family members who were sitting on both sides of the fence now I, I hate to admit this I hated the fact that we lost the game hated it I still hate it to this day but I will say this it was one of the greatest things that happened for the city Oh, great. Oh, man. You want to talk about like, you want to talk about like uh, rejuvenation. Like, I mean, the storm Katrina was 05 yes. August and they didn't know if the Saints were coming back. And then mm -hmm. the Monday night thing with uh, Gleason in 06, uh, yeah. you know, they beat the Falcons. And then I feel like for us, I mean, even just going out in the community um, as a player in 09 and we went to like port of call and, you know, you get, get a, a hamburger and I saw they had pizza on the online menu. And I asked them, I'm like, hey, can I get the pizza too? And like, oh, we haven't had that since the storm. And I'm like, that was 05. I mean, so so I feel like a lot of it, like the Super Bowl, you could feel the fans just just like give like a, a focus and it helped them rejuvenate. I mean, yeah. there's a new there's a new airport for for goodness sakes. Yeah. Which I didn't I didn't we went back for a 10 year reunion in December and and I was like, what we landed, my wife and I walked and I'm like, this is a normal looking airport. Like, where's the old uh, MSY? Where's the old, you know, old yeah. old uh, airport? So yeah, that's that's cool. Really and, cool. and, and I'll piggyback off of that just because I had family members that lived through that Katrina experience and, you know, the families being separated and, and throughout the entire country, but having an opportunity for the city to, to come back and rejoice and had that opportunity to experience that. Like I said, I, I hated it, but I am so happy for the city. And just what you just said, it's just been a resurgence of fans since. Yeah. yeah, I mean, did you have family members who were displaced permanently? Uh, oh, well, yeah. well, they were displaced. Now, I had family members that decided to, to, to move out of the city and just stay yeah. away. But I've had family members that have also moved back and said, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going back home. They're, they're, that's where all the enemies are located. So okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they didn't set the foundation. It's been there. And so the foundation has returned and they're not going anywhere. Oh, that's good. Hey, Coach, it's a good segue of what I want to talk about with you on this episode is just because um, with the virtual OTA, OTAs and all that, there's only so much that you can do and what you can talk about with the guys. So I want to do story time uh, with you because I know your, uh, your affinity for telling stories. And uh, the first one is more of a, a philosophy that I'm just curious um, in talking with you and kind of your story growing up, growing up, living in Louisiana till you were 12. And then when your parents divorced, you moved to Southern California. And I know we spoke about it in the past about you going to Southern California and all the different cultures that you experienced there compared to where you were in Louisiana. I'm just curious how you feel like even at a young age, making that move and that life changing moment or decision that, that your family made kind of put you in a position to be able to relate 
to so many different people now as a coach, thinking back to some of the things that happened when you were younger and kind of that move um, with your parents? Well, first of all, it, during that day and age, it was it was a tough time. My mom and dad they got divorced at a young age, and my um, my mom ended up getting remarried. So she remarried this gentleman by the name of Thaddeus Saint Cyr, who basically raised me and my younger brother Corey and my youngest brother Jamal. And during that time, we were still living in New Orleans when they got married. But you know, um, my stepfather Thaddeus, who passed away uh, a few years back, but we ended up moving out to Southern Cal. And at the time, me and my brother, because it was only me and my brother, Corey, we didn't like it at all. <laughs> but no it was the best thing that happened to us. Okay? It was the best thing that happened to us. Now, home will always be home. New Orleans will always be home. But also, too, living in Southern California helped us to grow as young men, being around all the different races of people, because Back in that day and age, it was just all black and white. We move out to Southern California. We're living with, you know, uh, a diverse group of people from all over. And it just helped because now you realize people are just people. And you learn to, to interact with all these different cultures. And you found out more than anything that you have more in common than, than, than anything. And it was, it was a great experience. And like I said, it's, it's helped us to grow tremendously. It's a lesson that we can well, all take from right now with what, what everybody's going through is that we're all in this together. Yes. That's so true. And then I know, I know Louisiana now is sort of like a, like a football hotbed, but <laughs> I mean, when you were growing up, I mean, not the same. So do you feel like your play uh, as a running back improved by moving to Southern California uh, as far yeah. as like iron sharpens iron sort of concept? I, I will say this, the, 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 the hunger and the desire, I mean, you had some people that came out of the state of Louisiana during that time. Now, I shared a small story with you guys. Neil Smith, who the Kansas City Chiefs took uh, here in the first round many years ago. We played against each other in college. Neil Smith was actually a tailback, a running back, when we played Pop Warner ball together. We actually went to the same elementary school together at John A. Shaw. I have known <laughs> Neil Smith, yes. <laughs> but, Seven years, oh, this never came yes. up. That's amazing. <laughs> so, but you had a bunch of players that came from that, that city. And, and I will say this, the attitude and the mindset was shaped there. Uh, learning to evolve and grow in the game, that just took place as I, the older I got, you know, living in Southern California. It's got to be something in the water in Louisiana when it comes to running backs because you got yourself and then just look at the Chiefs. You got Spencer Ware, Sharkandrick West, Darrell Williams, and now Clyde Edwards Elaire. What is it about Louisiana? <laughs> <laughs> you know what is is it's 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 just a way of life you, you players down there love to play football they love to compete and those guys just they just see it in a different way it it I don't know I, it's hard to put in words but there's just a different mindset when it comes to playing football and when I when I was a college coach I used to love recruiting out there and I used to always reach out to one of my buddies who's the uh, D-line D coach now with uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, Carl Dunbar, and even Frank Wilson, who's not a head coach at, uh, oh, man, I think he's at McNeese State now. But I always reached out to him, just to let me know who you, who you guys are recruiting so I don't recruit him because, hell, I can't compete with LSU. <laughs> but <laughs> I just need one player just to bring him out there. And, but because those kids, first and foremost, they don't want to return home as a failure. They love the fact that they get to explore and see other things, but also too, they want to make sure that they're doing a great job of representing where they're from. Now, I, I, it's funny that you bring this up and I'm going to bring this up as well. At one time when um, I had got hired at, uh, with the Minnesota Vikings, I was actually, let's just so recruiting Joe McKnight. So when I was at UCLA, uh, you know, I was recruiting because I had recruited three of his teammates from John Eric High School. I mean, John Curtis High School. And, uh, and so when I was coaching in the league, I still had the same number. He called me up. He was like, Coach, why did you stop recruiting me? I want to go to UCLA. <laughs> I said, no. I'm coaching in the league now. So I had to reach out to Carl Durrell and all the other coaches. And, hey, listen, man, don't forget about Joe. Well, we lost him, obviously. He ends up going to USC, and the rest is history. 
So, but it's, oh, it's a special place to recruit to. That's good. You know, I think it is. And I think what it is down there, I remember when we first moved down there, um, all my neighbors, like we lived in this apartment complex and, and all my neighbors were, were all in my business. Right. And they were just like, what are you? And at first I was kind of like, why are these guys so nosy? But I think the essence of new Orleans is that everyone's a big family. And, and yeah. I think, I think that that's really what, what drives it as like a, a big little city. And yeah. so I think, I think when you say like, what's the secret sauce? I mean, how much would you attribute it to the family atmosphere of kind of everyone's someone's brother or everyone's someone's cousin too? Oh, that's exactly it. Cause here's the thing. And I always say this, if you don't know them, I guarantee you somebody in your family knows that person <laughs> or knows true. that family member or somebody <laughs> in their family. That's, so and that's how it is. It's a big city, but it's a small town and everyone knows everyone and everybody celebrates together. I mean, you celebrate the food, you celebrate the culture, you celebrate the jazz and the history of music that have been created there. Yeah, because have you incorporated any crawfish boils into- Oh, ooh, I got some crawfish on the way that's coming up that'll be here tomorrow. Okay, so send me the address, BJ and I and Sid. We'll, we'll be over there, we'll bring beers, and we'll stay social distance, and I'll bring some andouille sausage, and all that good jazz, some cracklings, maybe too. Crawfish hole oh, yes. number two. <laughs> First place I'd ever had crawfish was with Sharkhandrick West in Shreveport. He there took me to crawfish number two. I walked in, just gave me a big like tablecloth and just set, just slammed him down. It's like, you want hot or regular? I was like, all right, here there we you go. go. He's That's making fun of right. me. I didn't know how to open them, but coach, I didn't <laughs> ask. <laughs> he, he did. I, I didn't. I had never done them before. Uh, Kansas kid. So. Coach, I want to ask you these couple of questions, and it's kind of changing the subjects a little bit, but mm -hmm. when people ask me just about different things, this is my perspective on what stood out to me and learning about you, and it's kind of like where you put your money where your mouth is and the things that you preach and the things that you talk about, and I want you to kind of tell me about this story. When you were playing for the Cincinnati Bengals as a player, and they offered you a three-year deal, and you told me you turned it down to take a league minimum one-year deal with the Philadelphia Eagles and Coach Reed because you wanted to go to a different culture. That's what you had told me a few years ago when we had talked about it. And mm -hmm. in today's day and age, where that, that, that could happen, the information doesn't always get out that a player could do that. But mm -hmm. I always thought that, and then the next thing I want to ask you about, spoke volumes about who you are and that you practice what you preach and, and being in the right environment. What made you make that decision, and how did you have so much confidence in what Reed's culture was going to be before? And nowadays, everybody knows what the culture is, but back then, it was early in his career, you weren't quite sure. So, what led you to make that decision? And looking back on it, how big of a decision was that that you made in your career? Well, that's so it's twofold. So, first of all, I was blessed and fortunate to play uh, four years with the Cincinnati Bengals. And I will say this the Brown family, Mike Brown, they took care of my family. Uh, I signed a two-year deal to start, and they ended up redoing my deal, and they took great care of me. And it was a great organization, but it was about being a part of something that was different. Uh, we we had some talented players, but we just didn't have a lot of players that was uh, that was focused on the main reason of why you play professional sports. And so I just wanted to be a part of something different. I wanted to be a part of a, a team that understood that, hey, you know what, we're going to build this from the ground up, but also, too, making sure that we understand that we all can see the big picture. So there has to be some sacrifices that are going to be made along the way. And so when I went there, the only thing I ever wanted to do was just to have a chance. They had a player, a hell of a player, and uh, assistant head coach there now, uh, in Deuce Staley. Well, I knew Deuce was going to be the starter. Well, the only thing I wanted to do is provide uh, Deuce some uh, some leadership, but also give him a, a break every now and then as a third down contributor, but also to, to, to possibly help shape him as a, as a professional player as well. But, you know, having that opportunity to do so and, and knowing Coach Reed and spending that time with him throughout that process, it was the right decision for me. I never played the game to play it for money. That was not who I am. I've never coached this game for money. I do it because I love it. And if I don't love it anymore, I'm done. I quit. <laughs> I can't do it. But it's not about the money. The money is not the driving factor. All right? It's almost I, I, it, 
So it's almost like, you know, what my next question is going to be, because that perfectly segues into this. People are going to think we planned this, but we've talked before about the invest in yourself program that Bob Lamont Mm -hmm. brought to Philadelphia when you were a player back in 1999, which nowadays is more of what the player engagement staffs would do kind of prepping for players uh, once their careers were over. And you had told me before that that program really helped change your life. And that after that 99 season, you, because of the program, you went back to school and you got so caught up in your school and your, your plan for after playing that you had an opportunity to come back and play and you decided not to because you were moving so far forward with, with your schooling and going back and and kind of starting that next phase of your career. And you gave me this quote and coach, I swear it's one of my favorite quotes that I've ever heard from a player or coach coach. You said, is your decision not to come back and play when you had the opportunity. You said, I never wanted to play the game or cheat somebody out of an opportunity that deserves to play, that wants to play just for dollars and cents. That's not why I played the game. If I was going to play, I wanted to have my heart and soul in it. So for the second time in your career, you walked away from money on the table to do what you thought was best, both in leaving Cincinnati to go to Philly and then from ending your playing career basically to move on based on the program that that coach and his agent Bob Lamont had brought over again looking back on that program and invest in yourself how much did that change your life and help you and me and your family basically be in this position it, put it this way if I don't have that program we probably wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation because it was one of the driving forces first and foremost that got me back into school but also led me to help lead me in the direction of coaching because I was I was dealing with people and I, I, I knew how to work with people. And I, I went back to school and I, I received a number of calls uh, throughout that time period. And, you know, just the excitement about being wanted again, you know, got me going. But then when you sat back, when I sat back and really dealt with reality, it was like, you know what, what am I doing? I, that's not what I want to do. That's not my focus right now. I'm doing what I need to do in school. There's some things that are taking place in my life. I don't want to take away from anyone else having this opportunity to achieve their goals. Plus, they're younger and they can provide, you know, more than what I can at this particular time. So, yes, money has never been the driving force. It's always been about the love of the game. So do you try to, do you try to coach that love or try to – I said – I mean, you didn't really coach love, but preach that love – to your offensive players and, and sort of like, Hey, you know, here's what you can do for the team. Here's how you contribute. Like, like what, what, what's your like message, especially to younger players? Uh, the message is, is, is making sure that guys understand that you have to be committed. You got to be willing to sacrifice them. Everybody's going to be held to the same highest level of, of accountability. All right. And then you got to understand what it takes to be a consistent and disciplined professional every day by showing up. And so, It's not about the individual. Yes, you have made it to the NFL, but now what are you gonna do to be a part of uh, an important piece of the puzzle to help us to achieve the bigger goal? And that's where, you know, uh, as, as a coach, that's what I try and do to get guys to understand there's a big picture that is involved in all this because when we win, we all win. Just because you go out and do something, you accomplish a personal goal, that might be a record-breaking goal throughout the, the, that, that particular game. But if it's not something that's going to continue to lead to us to have the success that we need to have throughout the, uh, the season with consistent behavior, then you know what? I, I want you to buy in and understand that, hey, it takes a collective effort, a collaborative effort for us to achieve the goals that we need to achieve. Coach, do you feel like this time with the quarantine and the virtual OTAs can in some ways kind of weed out certain teams that are maybe full of players that don't have the same kind of buy-in that that the guys that that Brett Veach and his staff and Coach Reed and all you guys that bring into this organization, guys that are locked in during OTAs and that are having to be trusted to take care of, you know, their business on the side. Not that, you know, everybody who gets to this level has some sort of, you know, self-responsibility in that way. But do you feel like there's an advantage because of the guys that you've brought in that love football and love the process that an environment like this will kind of weed them out and, and cream rise to the cr- crop? I mean, to the top in some way? Now, personally, personally and selfishly, yes. I, I, I do believe that it gives us an advantage. But it's hard for me to say that everybody else doesn't have that advantage either because one thing throughout this, everybody's going to be hungry <laughs> to get back together. You know what I mean? There's going to be a natural desire for everyone to, 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 
to to want to collaborate and get back and doing you know go back to living in a in a a normal world like we're used to but the thing that i appreciate is i thought that brett veach and his staff you know our head coach did a great job of just keeping the nucleus the the, the, the pieces together and one thing i've always said is we have a very very unique chemistry these guys like each other you know i think uh with the addition of of of, of, of frank and, and honey badger that kind of just added that hot sauce bro that little louisiana hot sauce on it to 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 bring in the essence <laughs> you know to spice up the gumbo but it's it's these guys like each other and they like being around each other and they understand that hey you know what if we can if we can do this collectively together there's a lot of things that we can achieve together as well that's funny they're like uh, old bay and some louisiana hot sauce added to the the, the gumbo pog the crawfish boil there you go Yes. So, and, and with that, and you know, obviously, uh, we've seen like the the nucleus being built and, and the family. So, it, is is Coach Reed is he on that same boat as you? Like, I mean, it seems like it from from an outside perspective. But is it sort of, you know, we're not essentially assembling a team, but we're assembling a bunch of guys that that want to help each other out, that want to treat this like a true family. Because I'm sure you've seen, you know, teams that are that are in locker rooms or in um, like a state of flux. You know, too many too many egos and things like that. Oh, yeah, I, I, I've known that about Coach Reed since 1999. And what you see is what you get. And a part of who he is, it's it's a family atmosphere, but also, too, there's a foundation of everyone being accountable, but also, too, everybody being willing to buy in. We're about team guys. And when 1999, when he took over, that's what he preached then. And you know what? It's the same message. Coach, before we let you go, I want to ask you one more question. I want us, I want you to give your best Andy Reid story from your playing <laughs> days. And you can't use the training camp that it was so hot that you told me that story. Before. You told me that story before the devil that running across the field. That might be the, the best field. story. Because right, here's the thing. Ahead. All right, BK. go ahead and tell the story. <laughs> so, first of all, you got to understand, in 1999, that summer in Lehigh, first of all, they were canceling goddamn practices. That's a hot <laughs> But we didn't Damn. cancel. In 99? Yes. And so that summer was one of the hottest summers ever. And every day you walked out there, and I swear you saw, you saw the devil run across the <laughs> You're like, damn, you could just see the heat rise in the boat. And I mean, it was brutal. And think about this. We had a bye week in training camp. Oh. Okay? So that just goes to show you how long a training camp we had. And I'm talking uh, just two days, just beating each other up. You know, and, and we as older players like to brag about all the different day and age of, of style of camps that we went through. But yeah. that camp really laid the foundation. One thing it did do, it developed a tough attitude. It developed a, a, a mindset that helped the foundation and what Coach Reed built. And one thing that you guys know, hey, we have tough training camps. I know the rules have changed, but we're going to get to work in, you know, and that's what we're about. And so, but that summer, my goodness, yes. I True can't story. say what I want to say, but yes, <laughs> we worked uh, out of us. <laughs> True story between you, Doug Peterson, telling me that's that same story about the same summer, and then Al Harris telling me the same thing. Yeah. Because of those stories, I've never, and I will not ask, coach or you or spags or anybody at training camp about how difficult this camp is because in the back of my mind i've got you talking about that one being like it's not even close i want to ask our former players about how camps were back in the day compared to now i know that we run a tough camp it's hard on the guys but because of those stories i will never ask those questions again it was it was a beauty it was but i will say this because of that it built a unique bond and guys are still tight because of that still close well, to this day well, I remember you saying after that first season, I think you guys went five and 11, but you knew something special was going to happen, even though it didn't happen then because of the culture, the way that they brought that philosophy and coach Reed, his, I mean, go, he was one of the first coaches, I think at that time, I think it had been a decade since a coach had gone from a position coach to a head coach without being a coordinator. And for mm -hmm. him to instill that process and that culture and that philosophy that early, having never been a coordinator was big time coach. We appreciate your time. We appreciate the stories. Next time we get together, we're going to have a crawfish boil, and that's how we're going to do the podcast. That'll work. I like that. I like you guys that. can teach hey. me how to open them. <laughs> oh, that was good. Hey, uh, whose job was it to start a fight to end practice? 
That's what I want to know. You <laughs> know what? That's here's the truth. Guys with two you and Deuce. Guys, you and Deuce. It, 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 guys were too damn tired to fight. <laughs> here's damn, the thing. You knew if you fought, I mean, hell, wasn't nobody going to break it up because it, it, it was going to take too much energy to break That's it up. true. Because so you had to go in the next play. <laughs> like, you know. Let them fight. It, They'll figure it out. <laughs> hey, Coach, we appreciate it. Uh, again, stay safe. Hopefully we'll see you soon. <laughs> you guys take care. Thanks. All right. All right, that was Eric Unimi and Dave Tobe. And those are some pretty good stories. I didn't realize you had connections to both of them, let alone the connection to Dave Tobe recruiting you back in high school. I've got so many more questions for him now. I know, right? I do too. Well, and I remember in high school, I remember, you know, vaguely, um, I, I had a few college coaches come through, but he was intense. And I remember in college being afraid of him because he was so intense. And even, even today for the interview, I was kind of like, whoa. And like, you don't get, like, as a special teams coach, it's kind of sort of like a, this sort of odd position and he brings offensive line background. And, and I think that's why the chiefs have had such good special teams is that when you have a coach who, who you're going to have to take it seriously, because honestly, you know, what he said was so true is some people, um, you know, like the, the weight room is sort of like an extension of the locker room. It's where you can kind of yeah. goof off and let your guard down. And that's where you do see good, good people, bad people, you know, and same thing with special teams, you know, people say, okay, it's my time to, to shine like me. That's one of the ways I earned a spot in a roster every year was doing the wedge and doing, you know, field goal teams. That was cool. And then, yeah. you know, with, with Coach Bienemy too, that, that New Orleans background, man, there's something that he said about down there, man. There's really something in the water, and it's a, it's a big little family down there. Yeah, it's, I've spoken with both those coaches for long-form articles that I'd written a few years ago. So I knew some of the stuff and a, a couple of those stories that Bienemy had shared before. But, uh, yeah, I think Dave Tobe's story of how he got into coaching with Curtis Jones passing away uh, with the aneurysm uh, before the season and then Justin Smith being there and kind of being what he says is the reason just goes to show that even the guys at the highest level of football in the world – um, had to catch a break somewhere. And I think everybody can kind of resonate with that. I caught a break. You've caught breaks uh, to get where you are. So um, I do definitely think it's cool. And I definitely think those stories should be shared. And when it comes to the enemy, um, I have some of those stories because I know just how good of a dude he is uh, and how good of a man he is. And one of the things that Jamal Charles told me years ago was that if you're trying to be a coach or if you're just trying to be a better man, that Eric the enemy is the guy that you look up to and you try to emulate. And that struck me. It, it just, it stood out to me. There's been a few things told about him. He's just a genuinely good dude. So um, that's why I asked those direct questions and set him up to talk about that just because it is real. And he practiced what he practices, what he preaches. So when he talks to players about contracts and the business of football, that Eric Bini would be doing this if he didn't get paid. Like he just loves the game of football and he's left money on the table in this sport at the NFL level, at least two times um, because of that, because he wanted to be in the best situation for himself and his family. Yeah, no, and I think it's cool. And I think frauds get exposed, um, you know, during the hard times. Like, if you're just doing it for money, then you're going to get exposed. But if you're playing for love and if you have a coach who's doing it for love, that's inspiring. And because, you know, they're, they are one way in the beginning of training camp, and then they're that same way, you know, <laughs> in, you know, if they're 0 and 10 or if they're 10 and 0. You know, so that's yeah. consistency is, is a big thing, especially with emotions and, and how often you have to see somebody. Like, you know, those guys are seeing each other from – you know, six in the morning to, to four in the afternoon, you know, uh, yep. Monday, Sunday through Monday, you know, it's, or Monday through Monday. They got to like each other. It's not going to be a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Me too. Me <laughs> so, too. Awesome. Well, this was a fun episode. I, I, I enjoyed this one. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed watching this one as well. Please let us know in the comments, rate, review, subscribe. If you're watching um, or listening uh, via any of the audio platforms, if you're on YouTube, let us know in the comments what you thought about this episode and all this story time as we are right here in the middle of the the dead part of the off season with just virtual OTAs going on now and training camp coming up here in a, in a few months. But again, appreciate everybody for listening. Nick, before we let, let everyone go, do you have any wise words of wisdom? No, social distance. You know, stay safe, wear a mask. Kansas City, you've got a champion! Holy cow, Wow. we've got a lot to get to. It'll go as a sack, Frank the Shark Clark! Look at it as a Chiefs fan, you got to be thrilled with the fact that you kept that entire wide receiver core together. 